families, creating a lifetime of memories. Sadly, some families are denied these important moments due to the sad practice of alienation. These are Families Divided. Hello, and welcome to Families Divided TV. In this segment, Dr. Joshua Coleman will be speaking to you on the five most common mistakes alienated and estranged parents make. Also, we'll see a brief segment with Dr. Amy Baker on how to inoculate your child from becoming alienated. Also, Lisa Rothfuss, one of our guest presenters at our conference in September on using and refining interpersonal skills, will be speaking to you about what her presentation will be about. We are now gonna to have to make our conference a virtual conference instead of in-person due to the inflation and the economy and all that it has entailed. So many of you have responded uh, about it being such a hardship now for you and we hear that and understand. So we are going to make this a virtual conference. Sadly, we were looking forward to being in person but it's not gonna be able to take place. But I do hope you'll join us. We're gonna have much special things going on during the two and a half days online. I do hope you can join us with us then. You'll be hearing from all of our guests right after these messages. At Victor's Crown, our focus is on you, our clients. When you arrive, our goal is that you will feel at home from our welcoming atmosphere to our serene surroundings. Everything we do at Victor's Crown is done with our clients in mind. We have comfortable seating areas for both adults and children. A large screen TV with surround sound where clients can be occupied with wholesome entertainment while they wait. We offer complimentary refreshments such as coffee, tea, water, and snacks. Due to the present COVID pandemic, our in-person appointments are restricted to selected cases. And those are held in our luxurious outdoor open air meeting space that we affectionately refer to as the COVID cabana, which was built specifically for our clients to offer them the most comfortable and relaxing outdoor space available. All our other clients are offered secured web-based telemed sessions where they can connect with us from anywhere in the world. Have you ever had a parent come into your office and repeatedly tell you all of the negative characteristics and behaviors of their co-parent? Have you ever had a child come into your office and tell you all of the negative experience they've had with their parent? Every single day in my office, I see families who are so stuck in their memories of the past, they can't move forward into a more positive future together. My name is Lisa Rothfuss, and I'm a psychotherapist here in Austin, Texas, with 35 years of experience working with children and families. I specialize in working in high-conflict families, families who are struggling with alienation, and families who are wanting to reunify. I'd like to invite you to attend the Family Access Conference in September of 2022, where I will be talking about how to move beyond these limiting mindsets that keep our families stuck in the past and help them move towards a more future-focused reunification process. This is a workshop that's for all family members and clinicians wanting to affect change in their relationships and in their therapeutic practice. This is Amy Baker here with some tips about how to inoculate your child from becoming alienated. So the first is to do everything you can to enhance the existing attachment relationship you have with your child. That means making the most of the shared emotional moments that you have with your child, being loving and compassionate as much as you can, and uh, really trying to um, do everything you can to make the child feel close with you. Even if you're having a disagreement, there's a way to have a disagreement that still creates a feeling of love and connection. 
The second is don't take the bait. Alienated kids can be very provocative. They can push your buttons. And in a way they're kind of testing, do you really love me? I'm hearing from the other parent you don't. And so they might try to push you to do something that would be unsafe, unloving, and unavailable. You need to be prepared for that. You need to have lots and lots of alternative uh, discipline and parenting strategies so that you don't get into a position where you do or say something that would uh, confirm the negative message about you. The third point I want to make is that you can foster certain values in your child that will make it less likely that he or she will become alienated. Those values are compassion, integrity, and forgiveness. And if you can do everything you can to uh, foster and encourage your child to identify as a person who values compassion, who is forgiving, and has integrity, knows what he thinks, knows what uh, his beliefs are, then it'll be less likely that child will become alienated. The next is to invite criticism. And that means saying to your child every once in a while, hey, how am I doing? What could I do to be a better parent? Is there anything that is bothering you about me or about our relationship? It doesn't mean you have to grovel if they say they're upset about something. It doesn't mean you have to give them a million dollars if they say that's what would make them happier. But you can um, sort of nip uh, problems in the bud before they fester. You don't want the child taking his or her criticism to the other parent. No, no good's going to come from that. So you want to make sure that your child feels comfortable coming to you and saying, hey, it sort of hurt my feelings when you did this or that. Praise your child when they come to you with the criticism rather than, you know, how dare you? Or why would you do that? Or who told you to think that? You know, always start with, thank you so much for telling me that you're upset. And then the final thing is to enhance your child's critical thinking skills. Get your child aware of the idea that you, that uh, ideas come from somewhere. They don't just, you know, pop into your head, that there's facts, that there's truth. And you want your child to think about thinking so that if one day he says, you know, you never loved me, you could, you could say, because it would be part of an ongoing conversation, oh, what an interesting idea. Where did that come from? How do you know that's true? What would happen uh, if I had evidence to the contrary? So you can uh, start by just talking to your child about the idea that um, we can think about how we come to our ideas. and how we form our opinions so that your child is less susceptible of having a false, untrue belief about you planted in them. All right, so there's a lot more I could say about each of these five, but I hope this little tip is helpful. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to my broadcast, which is on the five most common mistakes of estranged and alienated parents. And when I say mistakes, I want people to know that these are mistakes that everybody goes through because of how disorienting it is when a child of any age stops talking to a parent. But if we just think about the common reactions that every parent feels as they begin to see their child slipping away or making false accusations, of them or accusing things of things that they didn't do or not giving them a way to repair for the mistakes that they did make or the things that they're upset about or telling the parent things that they know that they heard from the other parent that they don't believe ever, was ever something that the parent actually did. All those things evoke incredibly powerful emotions and we're often not at our best when we're being governed by really powerful emotions. So if we think about some of the most common emotions that happen when an estrangement or alienation begins to get set off, one is fear. Will I ever see my child again? Is this ever going to resolve? Am I going to be able to correct the false ideas that they have about me or repair the real mistakes that I've made? Anger, not only at the ex, if in the case of alienation, but anger at the child for not being able to acknowledge all the good ways that the parent has parented, all the opportunities they may have provided the child that nobody ever provided for them, or the ways that they've been more conscientious or involved or um, psychological or emotional or caring, all the sacrifices that they made. Guilt is also a very common emotional reaction that can cause parents to make mistakes, feeling like, you know, maybe I'm a terrible person or a terrible parent or 
feeling terrible about the, the problems that were existing in the relationship. Shame, how can I tell other people that my child isn't talk to me or doesn't want to talk to me and uh, the social isolation that, that comes as a result of that. If I tell people that my child doesn't talk to me of any age, are they gonna blame me? So I don't wanna feel blamed. So I'm gonna isolate myself so I don't have to see other people with their loving relationships with their children. And finally, grief, loss, and, and sorrow. Because when we're going through this kind of an experience, nothing can create more profound feelings of grief, loss, and sorrow than the child to whom we've dedicated our lives and love and care to doesn't want to talk to us anymore or is seeing us in this very negative, destructive light that we can feel like there may be no way to get, get uh, into repair um, with them. So, so all of those very powerful, profound emotions can cause us to make mistakes. And I want people to be oriented to the fact that when I say mistakes, I'm saying that everybody makes them. I made them when I was going through my estrangement. Every parent that I've ever worked with um, makes them. And one of the most common mistakes is the idea that it should be fair. And so the mistake is that it should be, you should be focused on fairness rather than strategy. It, because the reality is, if it were fair, it would be more like the model of friendship, you know, that that you, you know, you repair it, you apologize, you make amends, you dust yourself off and you, uh, you know, everything kind of moves forward from that. When you're going through an estrangement or alienation, that's not the case. If it were fair, you could make more demands for your child, either to forgive you or to spend time with you or more demands to spend time with your grandchild. You can make more demands for empathy or forgiveness if it were fair. Um, you could make, get more credit for all the ways that you've sacrificed for your child, all the money that you spent on them, all the ways that you um, gave them opportunities nobody ever gave you. Maybe you stayed in a bad marriage um, in order to protect your child from a divorce, or you got out of a bad marriage to protect your child from a bad marriage. If it were fair, you'd get some credit for that either. Also, if it were fair, you'd get credit for being a better parent than your own, own parents were, if you had the misfortune to be raised by bad or neglectful or abusive parents. If it were fair, your child would understand that when you said you did the best that you could, they would really get that you really did the best that you could, and that you should be given some forgiveness for that, that parents in general do the best that they can based on who their child is, who they're married to, what their socioeconomic level is like, what the culture of parenting is like uh, when they're raising their child, what their own childhoods were like. And so this idea that parents are sort of really supposed to just be perfect ideal parents no matter what their circumstances are is completely unfair to the parent. So if it were fair, you'd get credit for that. If it were fair, you could talk about the ways that your own child made parenting difficult or continue to make parenting difficult either because of their mental illness or because of the alienation or because of the person that they got married to or because of the way that since they've become an adult, they need to blame you for the ways that their life has turned out. If it were fair, you would be able to do, to do that as well. So what I want you to be oriented to is that you have to be practical and not be focused on what, what's fair. Because if you're too oriented towards what is fair, you're not gonna actually, uh, you're gonna make a bunch of mistakes around that. You're gonna insist on things, you're gonna guilt trip your child, et cetera. So I think the best model, if you're working on that, is the model that we have when our children are much younger. And that is that it's kind of a one-way street that you can't expect it to be fair or equal. Maybe you have an adult child that you're not estranged or alienated from, and you can have a more kind of equal relationship with them. But if your kid is not talking to you, it's going to be, be and feel more selfless in that way. It's basically going to be more of a one-way street. Um, you want to have a model of what your child is doing in a way that protects you from feeling too victimized. In other words, you want to have a model for them that allows you to feel more compassionate for them, that in the same way that parents do the best that we can do when we're raising our children. When our children cut off contact, they're doing the best that they can do given where they are in their lives. Now, that doesn't mean that we have to like it, but the more empathy and compassion and understanding you have for that, the better off you're going to be and the better you're going to be able to reconcile with your child. But in related, related to that, 
is that you have to have love and self-compassion for yourself. Perhaps that's the single most important thing if you're going through an estrangement or an alienation. You also have to reclaim your own value as a parent and not cede that to your child. We're all vulnerable to believing what our children say about us, even if what they're saying about us isn't really true. So if you believe that you were a good parent or are a good parent or the accusations being made against you aren't false, you may not be able, are false, you may not be able to persuade your child about that. But you can hold on to that feeling yourself, and it's critical that you do. So how do you do all of that? Well, you have to distinguish between what you tell your child and what you tell yourself. So what you tell your child is that you want to be focused on uh, communication that is, is empathic and compassionate and interested. You want to be what I call a co-investigator, which means that if your child makes an accusation of you or has a complaint about you, your attitude isn't, isn't your goal isn't to just prove them wrong, because if they believe it, they believe it. And you're not just going to be able to say, well, you're wrong about that. Because by the time a child of any age has a belief, it's basically in there. So the only way to persuade them that it's not true is to show up in a way that makes you seem very compelling. And you do that through empathy and compassion and taking responsibility, being willing to look at yourself, being able to look at yourself. So I make the distinction between self-dialogue versus what you say to your child. You can tell yourself, I don't deserve this. This is wrong. This is rewriting history. This is my ex's fault. They've been brainwashed, but that's not going to work with your child. So you want to speak to yourself without criticism, with self-compassion, with forgiveness, and perhaps with compartmentalization. Now, in general, my experience is that dads do that a little bit more easily than do moms. For most mothers, the feeling is I should just keep giving and giving and giving and giving no matter what. And that's not necessarily, that may be, have been a good thing when you were raising your child, but if your kid isn't speaking to you and they're alienated from you or they're, they're accusing you of all kinds of things that you never did, at some point it may not make sense to continue to try and try and try. It may be better for you to stop, stop trying. Okay, so this gets us to mistake number two, which is trying to motivate your child through guilt. Guilt is your enemy. In other cultures, in earlier generations, it'd be much easier for parents to guilt trip their kids about not being in contact. What, you haven't called your mother? What's wrong with you? That would be very common and is still as common in, in some cultures, but not in our highly individualistic culture um, in the US. So guilt is your enemy. The more you make your child feel guilty, responsible for your feelings, the worse off you're going to be. Why is that? Because nothing compels your adult child to have a relationship with you beyond whether or not they really want to have a relationship with you. And there's enormous social support for cutting off a parent today. There's support with their therapists. There's support in the larger culture that estrangement or alienation is almost considered an act of existential courage or autonomy or individuality. If you look at the uh, surveys that are being done with at least with estranged adult children, the majority say that they feel better off for it. They may be saying that they it's better for their mental health. So there's a from an adult child's perspective, they may view it as having a lot of upside to being estranged. Whereas for the parent, it's all downside, right? It's all guilt, grief, sadness, anger, despair, sorrow, regret. So you're not going to motivate your kid through guilt. You can't blame them. You can't criticize them. Um, you know, you can't say anything or do anything that's going to trigger their guilt. And it also has to do with the way that the culture has changed about family. It used to be honor thy mother and thy father, respect thy elders. And those were kind of the institutional structures that compelled behavior across the generations. Today, that's no longer true. Today, what holds parents and adult child, children together is really the quality of the relationship. If the relationship makes the adult child feel cared about or heard or seen or doesn't make them feel bad, then it increases the probability that the adult child is going to want to have a relationship with a parent. If it makes a child feel in any way triggered, upset, criticized, gaslit, boundary crossing, et cetera, any of those things that I'm sure many, if not all of you have gotten some version of, um, then they're going to withdraw and pull away and not be motivated to have contact with you. So common things that might make them feel guilty is criticizing them, certainly criticizing their spouse, criticizing uh, their therapist, or sometimes it's just talking about the pain in your life, the pain of missing them, uh, your own aches and pains of getting older. Maybe you've been diagnosed with, a, with an illness. It seems like 
that should motivate children. But for a child who's getting advice from their therapist or the larger culture not to be codependent or not to feel like they're supposed to take responsibility for other people's feelings or somehow feeling guilty is this bad, terrible thing rather than a kind of appropriate thing for people to feel. If they're getting advice in that context, if you make them feel guilty, then you're much more likely to be labeled as toxic and problematic and gaslighting, et cetera. So that's why I say that, that guilt is your enemy and you wanna be careful to avoid doing that. Okay, mistake number three. So in my book, Rules of Estrangement, and my first book on um, estrangement and alienation called When Parents Hurt, I talk a lot about the importance of writing a letter of amends. And in my research that I've done with estranged parents for the University of Wisconsin Survey Center, I found that um, for those parents who did later reconcile, an amends letter was commonly a really powerful uh, source towards leading towards reconciliation. Now, why would that be the case? Well, it has to do with what I was saying earlier, that you have to get on the same page as your adult child. If you're just sitting back going, no, you're wrong, know that you're, you're just being brainwashed by your therapist or by my ex, you know, or the person that you're married to, or I didn't do that, or you're not remembering all the good times, you've lost your audience. Your goal is to help your child not to feel defensive about what it is that you're saying. And an amends letter is the best way to do that. So in an amends letter, you're writing with empathy, with, um, with compassion, you're taking responsibility, you're finding the kernel of truth, if not the whole bushel of truth uh, in their complaints. If you don't know what the complaints are, then you might say that you, uh, it's clear that you have blind spots that you don't know, but you'd like to learn more. So some of the common mistakes that parents make when they write an amends letter is that they're too defensive. They don't go far enough. They don't go deep enough. They don't show the willingness to really look at their own uh, complicity in, in creating these issues. I'm not saying every estrangement or alienation is the parent's fault. I certainly don't have that belief. But you still have to do that deep dive of, of looking at yourself and due diligence. It doesn't help to explain, well, I was a single mother. Well, you know, you're father turned you against me or any of those things, explanation loses your audience. You also can't persuade them. Well, you'll be better off if you reconcile or so will your kids. No, it doesn't, it doesn't work. You have to find the kernel of truth. And one of the ways to do that is to look at it from a perspective of separate realities. That as parents, we could reasonably and objectively feel like we did a really good job raising our children. And our child may reasonably feel like they wish we had done something different, that we've been more involved, less involved, you know, seen some part of their personality that need, needed to be developed more. Now, this is particularly true these days when parents are held to a much higher standard. So part of the problem that parents are experiencing is that the standards for parenting are going up and up and up, but the standards of what the child owes the parent is going down and down and down. And what that means is that parents have to be much more um, take the leadership role in reconciliation. Your child is probably not going to take the leadership role in that. That's why you have to do it and you have to do the hard work. Is that fair? No, it's strategic. It goes back to, to mistake number, number one. Finally, if you're writing an amends, you want to avoid getting into who's right um, and who's, who's wrong. You don't want to blame the child. You don't want to blame um, you, you know, your ex or anybody else because it's just going to backfire on you. Okay, mistake number four, returning fire with fire. It's human nature if you're being wrongly accused, if your kid's rewriting history, if they're saying things that you know that are, they're just parroting with the other parent. Said in the case of alienation, you're gonna to wanna to push back and you're gonna to wanna to push back hard. Do not do that. That's an enormous mistake. You don't, every time you do something that makes your child feel defensive, you just lost, lost your audience. You always have to, to respond in a way that keeps the conversation going. So if your child yells at you, blames you, is mean to you, and I'll talk about this in a upcoming, uh, in a later webinar on handling disrespect and abuse. But if your child is, is doing that, there's a right way to respond and a, right, and a wrong way to, to respond. In general, you wanna avoid um, being reactive or defensive to the child. You still wanna try to find the kernel of truth, even if it's being expressed terribly. You wanna set limits on the bad behavior, but try to return to the topic. You might say, well, it's hard for me to concentrate when you speak to me like that, that kind of thing. But you also wanna to try to have a good theory or understanding or reason for their 
um, aggressive or disrespectful behavior. Sometimes they're disrespectful or um, abusive because you're not actually responding to the things that they're really upset about, or they're influenced by your ex, or they're influenced by the person that they're married to, or they're influenced by their mental illness. It doesn't matter. What matters is that if you shove back hard, you're pushing away your audience. You want to represent yourself as somebody who is loving and credible, but you know, respects themselves, but is also respectful of the child. You basically want to be like the lighthouse that's on the beach and have the view of your child that they're kind of going up and down in the waves. And sometimes they can see you more clearly and other times they're being pushed underwater, but you're just steady. You're steady with your compassion and your interest um, and your empathy and your commitment to their well-being. Okay, mistake number five, thinking reconciliation happens quickly. Typically reconciliation does not happen quickly. It's more like a marathon than a sprint. Sometimes it does happen quickly. Sometimes a parent will write a great amends letter and the kid will say, Finally, I really feel heard and understood. Yes, let's get together. It does happen. More commonly, it happens drips and drabs over time. So you want to be, you know, kind of in it to win it for the long haul. Crumbs may be a good predictor of, of progress. Crumbs meaning, you know, you occasionally get the card or the Mother's Day card or the Father's Day card or the birthday. It doesn't mean if you don't get those that all is lost, but those can be a good predictor of um, of progress, but also when reconciliation happens, it also also can happen in a way that's much slower. All right, bonus bonus mistake is uh, um, assuming that their distance is all because of you. The reality is that by the time we have adult children, our their, their lives are on their own trajectory, and they're you know our children and grandchildren may be at the forefront of our minds, but they're not at the forefront. We're not at the forefront of their minds. They're preoccupied with their own children, their marriages, their divorce, their careers, their education. We're way down the list. And so often the distance or even the irritability or whatever may seem like it's about you, but it's not actually about you. All right. Well, that completes my portion of uh, my webinar on uh, five most common mistakes. And I look forward to seeing you in other uh, workshops and webinars and events through Families Divided. Next week on Families Divided, Dr. Edward Kruk speaks with Dr. Colleen Murray on the need for a multifaceted approach to addressing parental alienation.